Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley 1. Introduction Western Civilization in its World Setting Cultural Evolution in Civilizations Cultural Diffusion in Western Civilization Europe's Shift to the 20th Century Cultural Evolution in Civilizations There have always been men who have asked, Where are we going? But never, it would seem, have there been so many of them. And surely never before have these myriads of questioners asked their question in such dolorous tones, or rephrased their question in such despairing words, Can man survive? Even on a less cosmic basis, questioners appear on all sides seeking meaning or identity, or even, on the most narrowly egocentric basis, trying to find myself. One of these persistent questions is typical of the 20th century rather than of earlier times. Can our way of life survive? Is our civilization doomed to vanish, as it did to the Incas, the Sumerians and the Romans. From Giovanni Battista Vico in the early 18th century to Oswald Spengler in the early 20th century and Arnold J. Toynbee in our own day, men have been puzzling over the problem whether civilizations have a life cycle and follow a similar pattern of change. From this discussion has emerged a fairly general agreement that men live in separately organised societies, each with its own distinct culture, that some of these societies, having writing and city life, exist on a higher level of culture than the rest, and should be called by the different term civilizations, and that these civilizations tend to pass through a common pattern of existence. From these studies, it would seem that civilizations pass through a process of evolution which can be analysed briefly as follows. Each civilization is born in some inexplicable fashion and, after a slow start, enters a period of vigorous expansion, increasing its size and power, both internally and at the expense of its neighbours, until gradually a crisis of organisation appears. When this crisis has passed, and the civilization has been reorganized, it seems somewhat different. Its vigor and morale have weakened. It becomes stabilized and eventually stagnant. After a golden age of peace and prosperity, internal crises again arise. At this point, there appears, for the first time, a moral and physical weakness which raises, also for the first time, questions about the civilization's ability to defend itself against external enemies. Racked by internal struggles of a social and constitutional character, weakened by loss of faith in its older ideologies, and by the challenge of newer ideas incompatible with its past nature, the civilization grows steadily weaker until it is submerged by outside enemies and eventually disappears. When we come to apply this process, even in this rather vague form, to our own civilization, Western civilization, we see that certain modifications are needed. Like other civilizations, our civilization began with a period of mixture of cultural elements from other societies, formed these elements into a culture distinctly its own, began to expand with growing rapidity as others had done, and passed from this period to expansion into a period of crisis. But at this point, the pattern changed. In more than a dozen other civilizations, the age of expansion was followed by an age of crisis, and this, in turn, 
by a period of universal empire in which a single political unit ruled the whole extent of civilization. Western civilization, on the contrary, did not pass from the age of crisis to the age of universal empire, but instead was able to reform itself and entered upon a new period of expansion. Moreover, Western civilization did not once, but several times. It was this ability to reform or reorganize itself again and again which made Western civilization the dominant factor in the world at the beginning of the 20th century. As we look at the three ages forming the central portion of the life cycle of a civilization, we can see a common pattern. The age of expansion is generally marked by four kinds of expansion. One, of population. Two, of geographic area. Three, of production. And four, of knowledge. The expansion of production and the expansion of knowledge give rise to the expansion of population, and the three of these together give rise to the expansion of geographic extent. This geographic expansion is of some importance because it gives the civilization a kind of nuclear structure made up of an older core area, which had existed as part of the civilization even before the period of expansion, and a newer peripheral area, which became part of the civilization only in the period of expansion and later. If we wish, we can make, as an additional refinement, a third semi-peripheral area between the core area and the fully peripheral area. These various areas are readily discernible in various civilizations of the past and have played a vital role in historic change in these civilizations. In Mesopotamian civilization, 6000 BC to 300 BC, the core area was the lower valley of Mesopotamia. The semi-peripheral area was the middle and upper valley, while the peripheral area included the highlands surrounding this valley and more remote areas like Iran, Syria and even Anatolia. The core area of Cretan civilization, 3500 BC to 1100 BC, was the island of Crete, while the peripheral area included the Aegean Islands and the Balkan coasts. In classical civilization, the core area was the shores of the Aegean Sea. The semi-peripheral area was the rest of the northern portion of the eastern Mediterranean Sea, while the peripheral area covered the rest of the Mediterranean shores and ultimately Spain, North Africa and Gaul. In Canaanite civilization, 2200 BC to 100 BC, the core area was the Levant, while the peripheral area was the western Mediterranean at Tunis, western Sicily and eastern Spain. The core area of western civilization, AD 400 to sometime in the future, has been the northern half of Italy, France, the extreme western part of Germany and England. The semi-peripheral area has been central, eastern and southern Europe and the Iberian Peninsula, while the peripheral areas have included North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and some other areas. This distinction of at least two geographic areas in each civilization is of major importance. The process of expansion, which begins in the core area, also begins to slow up in the core at a time when the peripheral area is still expanding. In consequence, by the latter part of the age of expansion, the peripheral areas of a civilization tend to become wealthier and more powerful than the core area. Another way of saying this is that the core passes from the age of expansion to the age of conflict before the periphery does. Eventually, in most civilizations, the rate of expansion begins to decline everywhere. It is this decline in the rate of expansion of a civilization which marks its passage from the age of expansion to the age of conflict. This latter is the most complex, most interesting, and most critical of all the periods of the life cycle of a civilization.
It is marked by four chief characteristics. A. It is a period of declining rate of expansion. B. It is a period of growing tensions and class conflicts. C. It is a period of increasingly frequent and increasingly violent imperialist wars. And D. It is a period of growing irrationality, pessimism, superstitions and otherworldliness. All these phenomena appear in the core area of the civilization before they appear in more peripheral portions of the society. The decreasing rate of expansion of the Age of Conflict gives rise to the other characteristics of the Age, at least in part. After the long years of the Age of Expansion, people's minds and their social organisations are adjusted to expansion, and it is a very difficult thing to readjust these to a decreasing rate of expansion. Social classes and political units within the civilization try to compensate for the slowing of expansion through normal growth by the use of violence against other social classes or against other political units. From this comes class struggles and imperialist wars. The outcomes of these struggles within the civilization are not of vital significance for the future of the civilization itself. What would be of such significance would be the reorganization of the structure of the civilization so that the process of normal growth would be resumed. Because such a reorganization requires the removal of the causes of the civilization's decline, the triumph of one social class over another or one political unit over another within the civilization will not usually have any major influence on the causes of the decline and will not, except by accident, result in such a reorganisation of structure as will give rise to a new period of expansion. Indeed, the class struggles and imperialist wars of the Age of Conflict will probably serve to increase the speed of the civilization's decline because they dissipate capital and divert wealth and energies from productive to non-productive activities. In most civilizations, the long-drawn agony of the Age of Conflict finally ends in a new period, the Age of Universal Empire. As a result of the imperialist wars of the Age of Conflict, the number of political units in the civilization are reduced by conquest. Eventually, one emerges triumphant. When this occurs, we have one political unit for the whole civilization. Just as the core area passes from the age of expansion to the age of conflict earlier than the peripheral areas, sometimes the core area is conquered by a single state before the whole civilization is conquered by the universal empire. When this occurs, the core empire is generally a semi peripheral state, while the universal empire is generally a peripheral state. Thus, Mesopotamia's core was conquered by semi-peripheral Babylonia about 1700 BC, while the whole of Mesopotamian civilization was conquered by more peripheral Assyria about 725 BC, replaced by fully peripheral Persia about 525 BC. In classical civilization, the core area was conquered by semi-peripheral Macedonia, about 336 BC, while the whole civilization was conquered by peripheral Rome, about 146 BC. In other civilizations, the universal empire has consistently been a peripheral state, even when there was no earlier conquest of the core area by a semi-peripheral state. In Mayan civilization, 1000 BC to 1550 AD, the core area was apparently the Yucatan and Guatemala, but the universal empire of the Aztecs centred in the peripheral highlands of central Mexico. In Andean civilization, 1500 BC to AD 1600, the core areas were on the lower slopes and valleys of the central and northern Andes, but the universal empire of the Incas centred in the highest Andes, a peripheral area. The Canaanite civilization, 2200 BC to 146 BC, 
had its core area in the Levant, but its universal empire, the Punic Empire, centred at Carthage in the western Mediterranean. If we turn to the Far East, we see no less than three civilizations. Of these, the earliest, Sinic civilization, rose in the valley of the Yellow River after 2000 BC, culminated in the Qin and Han empires after 200 BC, and was largely destroyed by ural altic invaders after AD 400. From this Sinic civilization, in the same way in which classical civilization emerged from Cretan civilization or Western civilization emerged from classical civilization, there emerged two other civilizations. A. Chinese civilization, which began about AD 400, culminated in the Manchu Empire after 1644 and was disrupted by European invaders in the period 1790 to 1930. And B. Japanese civilization, which began about the time of Christ, culminated in the Tokugawa Empire after 1600, and may have been completely disrupted by invaders from Western civilization in the century following 1853. In India, as in China, two civilizations have followed one another. Although we know relatively little about the earlier of the two, the latter, as in China, culminated in the universal empire ruled by an alien and peripheral people. Indic civilization, which began about 3500 BC, was destroyed by Aryan invaders about 1700 BC. Hindu civilization, which emerged from Indic civilization about 1700 BC, culminated in the Mughal Empire and was destroyed by invaders from Western civilization in the period 1500 to 1900. Turning to the extremely complicated area of the Near East, we can see a similar pattern. Islamic civilization, which began about AD 500, culminated in the Ottoman Empire in the period 13 to 1600, and has been in the process of being destroyed by invaders from Western civilization since about 1750. Expressed in this way, these patterns in the life cycles of various civilizations may seem confused, but if we tabulate them, the pattern emerges with some simplicity. From this table, a most extraordinary fact emerges. Of approximately 20 civilizations which have existed in all of human history, we have listed 16. Of these 16, 12, possibly 14, are already dead or dying their cultures destroyed by outsiders able to come in with sufficient power to disrupt the civilization, destroying its established modes of thought and action, and eventually wipe it out. Of these twelve dead or dying cultures, six have been destroyed by Europeans bearing the culture of Western civilization. When we consider the untold numbers of other societies, simpler than civilizations, which Western civilization has destroyed or is now destroying, societies such as the Hottentots, the Iroquois, the Tasmanians, the Navajos, the Caribs, and countless others, the full frightening power of Western civilization becomes obvious. One cause, although by no means the chief cause, of the ability of Western civilization to destroy other cultures rests on the fact that it has been expanding for a long time. This fact, in turn, rests on another condition to which we have already alluded, the fact that Western civilization has passed through three periods of expansion, has entered into an age of conflict three times, each time has had its core area conquered almost completely by a single political unit, but has failed to go on to the Age of Universal Empire, because from the confusion of the Age of Conflict, there emerged each time a new organisation of society capable of expanding by its own organisational powers, with the result that the four phenomena characteristic of the Age of Conflict decreasing rate of expansion, class conflicts, imperialist wars and irrationality, 
were gradually replaced once again by the four kinds of expansion typical of the age of expansion, demographic, geographic, production, knowledge. From a narrowly technical point of view, this shift from an age of conflict to an age of expansion is marked by a resumption of the investment of capital and the accumulation of capital on a large scale, just as the earlier shift from the age of expansion to the age of conflict was marked by a decreasing rate of investment and eventually by a decreasing rate of accumulation of capital. Western civilization began, as all civilizations do, in a period of cultural mixture. In this particular case, it was a mixture resulting from the barbarian invasions which destroyed classical civilization in the period 700 to 970 AD, so that there was accumulation of capital and the beginnings of the investment of this capital in new methods of production. These new methods are associated with a change from infantry forces to mounted warriors in defence, from manpower, and thus slavery, to animal power in energy use, from the scratch plough and two-field, fallow agricultural technology of Mediterranean Europe, to the eight oxen, gang plough and three-field systems of the Germanic peoples, and from the centralised state-centred political orientation of the Roman world to the decentralised private power feudal network of the medieval world. In the new system, a small number of men, equipped and trained to fight, received dues and services from the overwhelming majority of men who were still expected to till the soil. From this Inequitable but effective defensive system emerged an inequitable distribution of political power and, in turn, an inequitable distribution of the social economic income. This, in time, resulted in an accumulation of capital which, by giving rise to demand for luxury goods of remote origin, began to shift the whole economic emphasis of the society from its earlier organisation in self-sufficient agrarian units, to commercial interchange, economic specialisation, and, by the 13th century, to an entirely new pattern of society with towns, a bourgeois class, spreading literacy, growing freedom of alternative social choices, and new, often disturbing, thoughts. From all of this came the first period of expansion of Western civilization, covering the years 970 to 1270 AD. At the end of this period, the organization of society was becoming a petrified collection of vested interests. Investment was decreasing, and the rate of expansion was beginning to fall. Accordingly, Western civilizations, for the first time, entered upon the age of conflict. This period, the time of the Hundred Years' War, the Black Death, the Great Heresies and severe class conflicts, lasted from about 1270 to 1420 AD. By the end of it, efforts were arising from England and Burgundy to conquer the core of Western civilization. But, just at that moment, a new age of expansion using a new organisation of society which circumvented the old vested interests of the feudal, manorial system, began. This new age of expansion, frequently called the period of commercial capitalism, lasted from about 1440 to about 1680. The real impetus to economic expansion during the period came from efforts to obtain profits by the interchange of goods, especially semi-luxury or luxury goods, over long distances. In time, this system of commercial capitalism became petrified into a structure of vested interests in which profits were sought by imposing restrictions on the production or interchange of goods rather than by encouraging these activities. This new vested interest structure, usually called mercantilism, became such a burden on economic activities that the rate of expansion of economic life declined 
and even gave rise to a period of economic decline in the decades immediately following 1690. The class struggles and imperialist wars engendered by the Age of Conflict are sometimes called the Second Hundred Years' War. The wars continued until 1815, and the class struggles even later. As a result of the former, France, by 1810, had conquered most of the core of Western civilization. But here, just as had occurred in 1420, when England had also conquered part of the core of the civilization towards the latter portion of the Age of Conflict, the victory was made meaningless because a new period of expansion began. Just as commercial capitalism had circumvented the petrified institution of the feudal manoral system, chivalry, after 1440, so industrial capitalism circumvented the petrified institution of commercial capitalism, mercantilism, after 1820. The new age of expansion, which made Napoleon's military political victory of 1810 impossible to maintain, had begun in England long before. It appeared as the Agricultural Revolution about 1725, and as the Industrial Revolution about 1775, but it did not get started as a great burst of expansion until after 1820. Once started, it moved forward with an impetus such as the world had never seen before, and it looked as if Western civilization might cover the whole globe. The dates of this third age of expansion might be fixed at 1770 to 1929, following upon the second age of conflict of 1690 to 1815. The social organisation which was at the centre of this new development might be called industrial capitalism. In the course of the last decade of the 19th century, it began to become a structure of vested interests to which we might give the name monopoly capitalism. As early, perhaps, as 1890, certain aspects of the New Age of Conflict, the third in Western civilization, began to appear, especially in the core area, with a revival of imperialism, of class struggle, of violent warfare, and of irrationalities. By 1930, it was clear that Western civilization was again in the age of conflict. By 1942, a semi-peripheral state, Germany, had conquered much of the core of the civilization. That effort was defeated by calling into the fray a peripheral state, the United States, and another outside civilization, the Soviet society. It is not yet clear whether Western civilization will continue along the path marked by so many earlier civilizations, or whether it will be able to reorganize itself sufficiently to enter upon a new, fourth age of expansion. If the former occurs, this age of conflict will undoubtedly continue with the fourfold characteristics of class struggle, war, irrationality, and declining progress. In this case, we shall undoubtedly get a universal empire in which the United States will rule most of Western civilization. This will be followed, as in other civilizations, by a period of decay and ultimately, as civilization grows weaker, by invasions and the total destruction of Western culture. On the other hand, if Western civilization is able to reorganize itself and enters upon a fourth age of expansion, the ability of Western civilization to survive and go on to increasing prosperity and power will be bright. Leaving aside this hypothetical future, it would appear thus that Western civilization, in approximately 1500 years, has passed through eight periods. Thus, one, Mixture, 350 to 700 AD. 2. Gestation, 700 to 970 AD. 3. A. First expansion, 970 to 1270 AD. 4. A. First conflict, 1270 to 1440. Core Empire, England, 1420. 
3b, second expansion, 1440 to 1690, 4b, second conflict, 1690 to 1815, core empire, France, 1810, 3c, third expansion, 1770 to 1929, 4c, third conflict, 1893 to present, core empire, Germany, 1942. The two possibilities which lie in the future can be listed as follows. Reorganisation, 3D, fourth expansion, 1944 onwards. Continuation of the process, 5, Universal Empire, the United States, 6, Decay, 7, Invasion, End of the Civilization. From the list of civilizations previously given, it becomes somewhat easier to see how Western civilization was able to destroy, or is still destroying, the cultures of six other civilizations. In each of these six cases, the victim civilization had already passed the period of universal empire and was deep in the age of decay. In such a situation, Western civilization played a role as invader similar to that played by the Germanic tribes in classical civilization, by the Dorians in Cretan civilization, by the Greeks in Mesopotamia or Egyptian civilization, by the Romans in Canaanite civilization, or by the Aryans in Indic civilization. The Westerners who burst in upon the Aztecs in 1519, on the Incas in 1534, on the Mughal Empire in the 18th century, on the Manchu Empire after 1790, on the Ottoman Empire after 1774, and on the Tokugawa Empire after 1853, were performing the same role as the Visigoths and the other barbarian tribes to the Roman Empire after 377 AD. In each case, the results of the collision of two civilizations, one in the age of expansion and the other in the age of decay, was a foregone conclusion. Expansion would destroy decay. In the course of its various expansions, Western civilization has collided with only one civilization which was not already in the stage of decay. This exception was its half brother, so to speak the civilization now represented by the Soviet Empire. It is not clear what stage this orthodox civilization is in, but it clearly is not in a stage of decay. It would appear that orthodox civilization began as a period of mixture, 500 to 1300 AD, and is now in its second period of expansion. The first period of expansion covering 1500 to 1900 AD, had just begun to change into an age of conflict, 1900 to 1920, when the vested interests of the society were wiped away by the defeat at the hands of Germany in 1917, and replaced by a new organisation of society which gave rise to a second age of expansion since 1921. During much of the last 400 years, culminating in the 20th century, the fringes of Asia have been occupied by a semicircle of old, dying civilizations Islamic, Hindu, Chinese, Japanese. These have been under pressure from Western civilization, coming in from the oceans and from Orthodox civilization pushing outward from the heart of the Eurasian landmass. The oceanic pressure began with Vasco da Gama in India in 1498, culminated aboard the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay in 1945, and still continued with the Anglo-French attack on Suez in 1956. The Russian pressure from the continental heartland was applied to the inner frontiers of China, Iran and Turkey from the 17th century to the present. Much of the world's history in the 20th century has arisen from the interactions of these three factors, 
the continental heartland of Russian power, the shattered cultures of the buffer fringe of Asia, and the oceanic powers of Western civilization. Cultural Diffusion in Western Civilization We have said that the culture of a civilization is created in its core area originally and moves outward into peripheral areas which thus become part of the civilization. The movement of cultural elements is called diffusion by students of the subject. It is noteworthy that material elements of a culture, such as tools, weapons, vehicles and such, diffuse more readily and thus more rapidly than do the non-material elements, such as ideas, art forms, religious outlook, or patterns of social behaviour. For this reason, the peripheral portions of a civilization, such as Assyria in Mesopotamian civilization, Rome or Spain in classical civilization, and the United States or Australia in Western civilization, tend to have a somewhat cruder and more material culture than the core area of the same civilization. Material elements of a culture also diffuse beyond the boundaries of a civilization into other societies, and do so much more readily than the non-material elements of a culture. For this reason, the non-material and spiritual elements of a culture are what give it its distinctive character, rather than its tools and weapons, which can be so easily exported to entirely different societies. Thus, the distinctive character of Western civilization rests on its Christian heritage, its scientific outlook, its humanitarian elements, and its distinctive point of view in regard to the rights of the individual and respect for women, rather than in such material things as firearms, tractors, plumbing fixtures, or skyscrapers, all of which are exportable commodities. The export of material elements in a culture, across its peripheral areas and beyond, to the peoples of totally different societies has strange results, as elements of material culture move from core to periphery inside a civilization, they tend, in the long run, to strengthen the periphery at the expense of the core, because the core is more hampered in the use of material innovations by the strength of past vested interests, and because the core devotes a much greater part of its wealth and energy to non-material culture. Thus, such aspects of the Industrial Revolution as automobiles and radios are European rather than American inventions, but have been developed and utilised to a far greater extent in America, because this idea was not hampered in their use by surviving elements of feudalism, of church domination, of rigid class distinctions, for example in education, or by widespread attention to music, poetry, art or religion, such as we find in Europe. A similar contrast can be seen in classical civilization between Greek and Roman, or in Mesopotamian civilization between Sumerian and Assyrian, or in Mayan civilization between Mayan and Aztec. The diffusion of culture elements beyond the boundaries of one society into the culture of another society presents quite a different case. The boundaries between societies present relatively little hindrance to the diffusion of material elements, and relatively greater hindrance to the diffusion of non-material elements. Indeed, it is this fact which determines the boundary of the society, for, if the non-material elements also diffused, the new area into which they flowed would be a peripheral portion of the old society, rather than a part of a quite different society. The diffusion of material elements from one society to another has a complex effect on the importing society. In the short run, it is usually benefited by the importation, but in the long run it is frequently disorganised and weakened. 
when white men first came to North America, material elements from Western civilization spread rapidly among the different Indian tribes. The Plains Indians, for example, were weak and impoverished before 1543, but in that year the horse began to diffuse northward from the Spaniards in Mexico. Within a century, the Plains Indians were raised to a much higher standard of living because of ability to hunt buffalo from horseback, and were immensely strengthened in their ability to resist Americans coming westward across the continent. In the meantime, the Trans-Appalachian Indians, who had been very powerful in the 16th and early 17th centuries, began to receive firearms, steel traps, measles, and eventually whiskey from the French and later the English by way of St. Lawrence. These greatly weakened the Woods Indians of the Trans-Appalachian area and ultimately weakened the Plains Indians of the Trans-Mississippi area because measles and whiskey were devastating and demoralising and because of the use of traps and guns by certain tribes made them dependent on whites for supplies at the same time that they allowed them to put great physical pressure on the more remote tribes which had not yet received guns or traps. Any united front of reds against whites was impossible, and the Indians were disrupted, demoralised and destroyed. In general, importation of an element of material culture from one society to another is helpful to the importing society in the long run only if it is a. productive, b can be made within the society itself, and C, can be fitted into the non-material culture of the importing society without demoralising it. The destructive impact of Western society upon so many other societies rests on its ability to demoralise their ideological and spiritual culture as much as its ability to destroy them in a material sense with firearms. When one society is destroyed by the impact of another society, the people are left in a debris of cultural elements derived from their own shattered culture as well as from the invading culture. These elements generally provide the instruments for fulfilling the material needs of these people, but they cannot be organised into a specific society because of the lack of an ideology and spiritual cohesion. Such people either perish or are incorporated as individuals and small groups into some other culture, whose ideology they adopt for themselves and, above all, for their children. In some cases, however, the people left with the debris of a shattered culture are able to reintegrate the cultural elements into a new society and a new culture. They are able to do this because they obtain a new non-material culture and thus a new ideology and morale which serve as a cohesive for the scattered elements of past culture they have at hand. Such a new ideology may be imported or may be indigenous, but in either case it becomes sufficiently integrated with the necessary elements of material culture to form a functioning whole and thus a new society. It is by some such process as this, that all new societies, and thus all new civilizations, have been born. In this way, classical civilization was born from the wreckage of Cretan civilization in the period 1150 BC to 900 BC, and Western civilization was born from the wreckage of classical civilization in the period AD 350 to 700. It is possible that new civilizations may be born in the debris from the civilizations wrecked by Western civilization on the fringes of Asia. In this wreckage is debris from Islamic, Hindu, Chinese and Japanese civilizations. It would appear at the present time that new civilizations may be in the throes of birth in Japan, possibly in China, less likely in India and dubiously in Turkey or Indonesia, 
The birth of a powerful civilization at any or several of these points would be of primary significance in world history, since it would serve as a counterbalance to the expansion of Soviet civilization on the landmass of Eurasia. Turning from a hypothetical future to a historical past, we can trace the diffusion of cultural elements within Western civilization from its core area across peripheral areas and outward to other societies. Some of these elements are sufficiently important to command a more detailed examination. Among the elements of the Western tradition, we have diffused only very slowly or not at all, are a closely related nexus of ideas at the basis of Western ideology. These include Christianity, the scientific outlook, humanitarianism, and the idea of the unique value and rights of the individual. But from this nexus of ideas have sprung a number of elements of material culture of which the most noteworthy are associated with technology. These have diffused readily, even to other societies. This ability of Western technology to emigrate and the inability of the scientific outlook, with which the technology is fairly closely associated, to do so have created an anomalous situation. Societies such as Soviet Russia, which have, because of lack of tradition of scientific method, shown little inventiveness in technology, are nevertheless able to threaten Western civilization by the use, on a gigantic scale, of a technology almost entirely imported from Western civilization. A similar situation may well develop in any new civilizations which come into existence on the fringes of Asia. The most important parts of Western technology can be listed under four headings. 1. Ability to kill, development of weapons. 2. Ability to preserve life, development of sanitation and medical services. 3. Ability to produce both food and industrial goods. 4. Improvements in transportation and communications. We have already spoken of the diffusion of Western firearms. The impact which these have had on peripheral areas and other societies, from Cortez's invasion of Mexico in 1519 to the use of the first atom bomb on Japan in 1945, is obvious. Less obvious, but in the long run of much greater significance, is the ability of Western civilization to conquer disease and to postpone death by sanitation and medical advances. These advances began in the core of Western civilization before 1500, but have exercised their full impact only since about 1750, with the advent of vaccination, the conquest of plague, and the steady advance in saving lives through the discovery of antisepsis in the 19th century and of the antibiotics in the 20th century. These discoveries and techniques have diffused outwards from the core of Western civilization, and have resulted in a fall in the death rate in Western Europe and America almost immediately, in Southern Europe and Eastern Europe somewhat later, and in Asia only in the period since 1900. The world-shaking significance of this diffusion will be discussed in a moment. Western civilization's conquest of the techniques of production are so outstanding that they have been honoured by the term revolution in all history books concerned with the subject. The conquest of the problem of producing food, known as the agricultural revolution, began in England as long ago as the early 18th century, say about 1725. The conquest of the problem of producing manufactured goods known as the Industrial Revolution, also began in England about 50 years after the Agricultural Revolution, say about 1775. The relationship of these two revolutions to each other and to the revolution in sanitation and public health 
and the differing rates at which these three revolutions diffused is of the greatest importance for understanding both the history of Western civilization and its impact on other societies. Agricultural activities, which provide the chief food supply of all civilizations, drain the nutritive elements from the soil. Unless these elements are replaced, the productivity of the soil will be reduced to a dangerously low level. In the medieval and early modern period of European history, these nutritive elements, especially nitrogen, were replaced through the action of the weather by leaving the land fallow, either one year in three or even every second year. This had the effect of reducing the arable land by half or one-third. The agricultural revolution was an immense step forward, since it replaced the year of fallowing with a leguminous crop whose roots increased the supply of nitrogen in the soil by capturing this gas from the air and fixing it in the soil in a form usable by plant life. Since the leguminous crop, which replaced the fallow year of the older agricultural cycle, was generally a crop like alfalfa, clover or sainfoin, which provided feed for cattle, this agricultural revolution not only increased the nitrogen content of the soil for subsequent crops of grain, but also increased the number of, and quality of, farm animals, thus increasing the supply of meat and animal products for food, and also increasing the fertility of the soil by the increasing supply of animal manure for fertilisers. The net result of the whole agricultural revolution was an increase in both the quantity and the quality of food. Fewer men were able to produce so much more food that many men were released from the burden of producing it and could devote their attention to other activities, such as government, education, science or business. It has been said that in 1700 the agricultural labour of 20 persons was required in order to produce enough food for 21 persons, while in some areas, by 1900, three persons could produce enough food for 21 persons, thus releasing 17 persons for non-agricultural activities. This agricultural revolution which began in England before 1725 reached France in 1800, but did not reach Germany or northern Italy until after 1830. As late as 1900, it had hardly spread at all into Spain, southern Italy and Sicily, the Balkans or Eastern Europe generally. In Germany, about 1840, this agricultural revolution was given a new boost forward by the introduction of the use of chemical fertilisers, and received another boost in the United States after 1880 by the introduction of farm machinery which reduced the need for human labour. These same two areas, with contributions from some other countries, gave another considerable boost to agricultural output after 1900, by the introduction of new seeds and better crops through seed selection and hybridization. These great agricultural advances after 1725 made possible the advances in industrial production after 1775 by providing the food and thus the labour for the growth of the factory system and the rise of industrial cities. Improvements in sanitation and medical services after 1775 contributed to the same end by reducing the death rate and by making it possible for large numbers of persons to live in cities without the danger of epidemics. The transportation revolution also contributed its share to making the modern world. This contribution began, slowly enough, about 1750, with the construction of canals and the building of turnpikes by the new methods of road construction devised by John L. Macadam, macadamised roads. Coal came by canal and food by the new roads to the new industrial cities after 1800, 
After 1825, both were greatly improved by the growth of a network of railroads, while communications were speeded by the use of the telegraph after 1837 and the cable after 1850. This conquest of distance was unbelievably accelerated in the 20th century by the use of internal combustion engines in automobiles, aircraft and ships and by the advent of telephones and radio communications. The chief result of this tremendous speeding up of communications and transportation was that all parts of the world were brought closer together and the impact of European culture on the non-European world was greatly intensified. This impact was made even more overwhelming by the fact that the transportation revolution spread outward from Europe extremely rapidly, diffusing almost as rapidly as the spread of European weapons, somewhat more rapidly than the spread of European sanitation and medical services, and much more rapidly than the spread of European industrialism, European agricultural techniques, or European ideology. As we shall see in a moment, many of the problems which the world faced in the middle of the 20th century were rooted in the facts that these different aspects of the European way of life spread outward into the non-European world at such different speeds that the non-European world obtained them in an entirely different order from that which Europe had obtained them. One example of this difference can be seen in the fact that in Europe the Industrial Revolution generally took place before the Transportation Revolution, but in the non-European world this sequence was reversed. This means that Europe was able to produce its own iron, steel and copper to build its own railroads and telegraph wires, but the non-European world could construct these things only by obtaining the necessary industrial materials from Europe and thus becoming the debtor of Europe. The speed with which the transportation revolution spread out from Europe can be seen in the fact that in Europe the railroad began before 1830, the telegraph before 1840, the automobile about 1890, and the wireless about 1900. The transcontinental railroad in the United States opened in 1869, by 1900, the Trans-Siberian Railway and the Cape to Cairo Railroad were under full construction, and the Berlin to Baghdad enterprise was just beginning. By the same date, 1900, India, the Balkans, China and Japan were being covered with a network of railroads, although none of these areas, at that date, was sufficiently developed in an industrial sense to provide itself with the steel or copper to construct or to maintain such a network. Later stages in the transportation revolution, such as automobiles or radios, spread even more rapidly and were being used to cross the deserts of the Sahara or of Arabia within a generation of their advent in Europe. Another important example of this situation can be seen in the fact that in Europe the agricultural revolution began before the industrial revolution. Because of this, Europe was able to increase its output of food and thus the supply of labour necessary for industrialization. But in the non-European world, except North America, the efforts to industrialise generally began before there had been any notable success in obtaining a more productive agricultural system. As a result, the increased supply of food, and thus of labour, needed for the growth of in industrial cities in the non-European world, has generally been obtained not from increased output of food so much as from a reduction of the peasants' share of the food produced. In the Soviet Union especially, the high speed of industrialization in the period 1926 to 1940 was achieved by a merciless oppression of the rural community in which millions of peasants lost their lives. The effort to copy this Soviet method in communist China in the 1950s brought that area to the verge of disaster. <laughs> 
The most important example of such differential diffusion rates of two European developments appears in the difference between the spread of the food-producing revolution and the spread of the revolution in sanitation and medical services. This difference became of such world-shaking consequences by the middle of the 20th century that we must spend considerable time examining it. In Europe, the agricultural revolution, which served to increase the supply of food, began at least 50 years before the beginnings of the revolution in sanitation and medical services, which decreased the number of deaths and thus increased the number of the population. The two dates of these two beginnings might be put roughly at 1725 and 1775. As a result of this difference, Europe generally had sufficient food to feed its increased population. When the population reached a point where Europe itself could no longer feed its own people, say about 1850, the outlying areas of the European and non-European worlds were so eager to be industrialised, or to obtain railroads, that Europe was able to obtain non-European food in exchange for European industrial products. This sequence of events was a very happy combination for Europe. But the sequence of events in the non-European world was quite different and much less happy. Not only did the non-European world get industrialization before it got the revolution in food production, it also got the revolution in sanitation and medical services before it got a sufficient increase in food to take care of the resulting increase in population. As a result, the demographic explosion which began in northwestern Europe early in the 19th century spread outward to Eastern Europe and to Asia with increasingly unhappy consequences as it spread. The result was to create the greatest social problem of the 20th century world. Most stable and primitive societies, such as the American Indians before 1492 or medieval Europe, have no great population problem because the birth rate is balanced by the death rate. In such societies, both of these are high, the population is stable, and the major portion of that population is young, below 18 years of age. This kind of society, frequently called population type A, is what existed in Europe in the medieval period, say about 1400, or even in part of the early modern period, say about 1700. As a result of the increased supply of food in Europe after 1725, and of men's increased ability to save lives because of advances in sanitation and medicine after 1775, the death rate began to fall, the birth rate remained high, the population began to increase, and the number of older persons in society increased. This gave rise to what we have called the demographic explosion, or population type B. As a result of it, the population of Europe, beginning in Western Europe, increased in the 19th century, and the major portion of that population was in the prime of life, ages 18 to 45, the arms-bearing years for men and the child-bearing years for women. At this point, the demographic cycle of an expanding population goes into a third stage, population type C, in which the birth rate also begins to fall. The reasons for this fall in the birth rate have never been explained in a satisfactory way, but as a consequence of it, there appears a new demographic condition marked by a falling birth rate, a low death rate, and a stabilising and ageing population whose major part is in the mature years from 30 to 60. As the population gets older because of the decrease in births and the increase in expectation of life, a larger and larger part of the population has passed the years of bearing children or bearing arms. This causes the birth rates to decline even more rapidly and eventually gives a population so old that the death rate begins to rise again because of the great increase in deaths from old age, or from the casualties of inevitable senility. <laughs>
Accordingly, the society passes into the fourth stage of the demographic cycle, population type D. This stage is marked by a declining birth rate, a rising death rate, a decreasing population, and a population in which the major part is over 50 years of age. It must be confessed that the nature of the fourth stage of this demographic cycle is based on theoretical considerations rather than on empirical observation, because even Western Europe, where the cycle is most advanced, has not yet reached this fourth stage. However, it seems quite likely that it will pass into such a stage by the year 2000, and already the increasing number of older persons has given rise to new problems and to a new science called geriatrics, both in Western Europe and in the Eastern United States. As we have said, Europe has already experienced the first three stages of this demographic cycle as a result of the agricultural revolution after 1725 and the sanitation medical revolution after 1775. As these two revolutions have diffused outwards from Western Europe to more peripheral areas of the world, the life-saving revolution passing the food production revolution in the process, these more remote areas have entered, one by one, upon the demographic cycle. This means that the demographic explosion, population type B, has moved outward from Western Europe to Central Europe to Eastern Europe and finally to Asia and Africa. By the middle of the 20th century, India was fully in the grasp of the demographic explosion, with its population shooting upward at a rate of about 5 million a year, while Japan's population rose from 55 million in 1920 to 94 million in 1960. A fine example of the working of this process can be seen in Ceylon, where in 1920 the birth rate was 40 per thousand and the death rate was 32 per thousand. But in 1950 the birth rate was still at 40, while the death rate had fallen to 12. Before we examine the impact of this development on world history in the 20th century, let us look at two brief tables which will clarify this process. The demographic cycle may be divided into four stages which we have designated by the first four letters of the alphabet. These four stages can be distinguished in respect to four traits. The birth rate, the death rate, the number of the population and its age distribution. The nature of the four stages in these four respects can be seen in the following table. Below is a table titled the demographic cycle. On the y-axis it has the four traits described above and on the x-axis it has the demographic stage A, B, C and D. So stage, birth rate, A, high, B, high, C, falling, D, low. Death rate, A, high, B, falling, C, low, D, rising. Numbers, A, stable, B, rising, C, stable, D, falling. Age distribution, A, many below 18 years old. B, many in prime, 18 to 45. C, many middle-aged, over 30, and D, many old, over 50. Returning to the text. The consequences of this demographic cycle and the resulting demographic explosion as it diffuses outward from Western Europe to more peripheral areas of the world may be gathered from the following table which sets out the chronology of this movement in the four areas of Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe and Asia. Below there is a table titled Diffusion of the Demographic Cycle. Dates in the y-axis from 1700 every 50 or 100 years to the year 2000 and then the area in consideration across the y-axis. 
In this table, the line of greatest population pressure, the demographic explosion of type B population, has been marked by a dotted line. This shows that there has been a sequence, at intervals of about 50 years, of four successive population pressures, which might be designated with the following names. Anglo-French pressure, about 1850, Germanic-Italian pressure, about 1900, Slavic pressure, about 1950, and Asiatic pressure, about 2000. This diffusion of pressure outward from the Western European core of Western civilization can contribute a great deal towards a richer understanding of the period 1850 to 2000. It helps to explain the Anglo-French rivalry about 1850, the Anglo-French alliance based on fear of Germany after 1900, the Free World Alliance based on fear of Soviet Russia after 1950, and the danger of both Western civilization and Soviet civilization from Asiatic pressure by the year 2000. These examples show how our understanding of the problems of the 20th century world can be illuminated by a study of the various developments of Western Europe and of the varying rates by which they diffused outwards to the more peripheral portions of Western civilization and ultimately to the non-Western world. In a rough fashion, we might list these developments in the order in which they appeared in the Western world, as well as the order in which they appeared in the more remote non-Western world. Developments in Western Europe 1. Western ideology 2. Revolution in weapons, especially firearms 3. Agricultural revolution 4. Industrial revolution 5. Revolution in sanitation and medicine 6. Demographic explosion 7. Revolution in transportation and communications Developments in Asia 1. Revolution in weapons 2. Revolution in transport and communications 3. Revolution in sanitation and medicine 4. Industrial revolution 5. Demographic explosion 6. Agricultural revolution 7. And last, if at all, Western ideology Naturally, these two lists are only a rough approximation of the truth. In the European list, it should be quite clear that each development is listed in the order of its first beginning and that each of these traits has been a continuing process of development since. In the Asiatic list, it should be clear that the order of arrival of the different traits is quite different in different areas and that the order given on this list is merely one which seems to apply to several important areas. Naturally, the problems arising from the advent of these traits in Asiatic areas depended on the order in which the traits arrive, and thus are quite different in areas where this order of arrival is different. The chief difference arises from a reversal of order between items 3 and 4. The fact that Asia obtained these traits in a different order from that of Europe is of the greatest significance. We shall devote much of the rest of the book to examining this subject. At this point, we might point out two aspects of it. In 1830, democracy was growing rapidly in Europe and in America. At that time, the development of weapons had reached a point where governments could not get weapons which were much more effective than those which private individuals could get. Moreover, private individuals could obtain good weapons because they had a high enough standard of living to afford it, as a result of the agricultural revolution, and such weapons were cheap, as a result of the industrial revolution. By 1930, and even more by 1950, the development of weapons had advanced to the point where governments could obtain more effective weapons, dive bombers, armoured cars, flamethrowers, poisonous gases, and such, than private individuals. Moreover, in Asia, 
these better weapons arrived before standards of living could be raised by the agricultural revolution or costs of weapons reduced sufficiently by the industrial revolution. Moreover, standards of living were held down in Asia because the sanitation, medical revolution and the demographic explosion arrived before the agricultural revolution. As a result, governments in Europe in 1830 hardly dared to oppress the people, and democracy was growing. But in the non-European world by 1930, and even more by 1950, governments did dare to, and could, oppress their peoples, who could do little to prevent it. When we add to this picture the fact that the ideology of Western Europe had strong democratic elements derived from its Christian and scientific traditions, while Asiatic countries had authoritarian traditions in political life, we can see that democracy had a hopeful future in Europe in 1830, but a very dubious future in Asia in 1950. From another point of view, we can see that in Europe, the sequence of agricultural, industrial, transportation revolutions made it possible for Europe to have rising standards of living and little rural oppression, since the agricultural revolution provided the food and thus the labour for industrialism and for transport facilities. But in Asia, where the sequence of these revolutions was different, generally transportation, industrial, agricultural, labour could be obtained from the sanitary medical revolution, but food for this labour could be obtained only by oppressing the rural population and preventing any real improvements in standards of living. Some countries tried to avoid this by borrowing capital for railroads and steel mills from European countries, rather than by raising capital from the savings of their own people but this meant that these countries became the debtors, and thus to some extent the subordinates of Europe. Asiatic nationalism usually came to resent this debtor role and to prefer the role of rural oppression of its own people by its own government. The most striking example of this preference for rural oppression over foreign indebtedness was made in the Soviet Union in 1928, with the opening of the five-year plans. Somewhat similar but less drastic choices were made even earlier in Japan and much later in China. But we must never forget that these and other difficult choices had to be made by Asiatics because they obtained the diffuse traits of Western civilization in an order different from that in which Europe obtained them. Europe's shift to the 20th century. While Europe's traits were diffusing outward to the non-European world, Europe was also undergoing profound changes and facing difficult choices at home. These choices were associated with drastic changes, in some cases we might say reversals, of Europe's point of view. These changes may be examined under eight headings. The 19th century was marked by 1. Belief in the innate goodness of man. 2. Secularism. 3. Belief in progress. 4. Liberalism. 5. Capitalism. 6. Faith in science. 7. Democracy. and 8. Nationalism. In general, these eight factors went along together in the 19th century. They were generally regarded as being compatible with one another. The friends of one were generally the friends of the others, and the enemies of one were generally the enemies of the rest. Metternich and de Maister were generally opposed to all eight. Thomas Jefferson and John Stuart Mill were generally in favour of all eight. The belief in the innate goodness of man has its roots in the 18th century when it appeared to many that man was born good and free, but that everywhere distorted, corrupted and enslaved by bad institutions and conventions. As Rousseau said, Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains.
Thus arose the belief in the noble savage, the romantic nostalgia for nature, and for the simple nobility and honesty of the inhabitants of a faraway land. If only man could be freed, they felt, freed from the corruption of society and its artificial conventions, freed from the burden of poverty, of the state, of the clergy, and of the rules of matrimony, then man, it seemed clear, could rise to heights undreamed of before, could, indeed, become a kind of superman, practically a god. It was this spirit which set loose the French Revolution. It was this spirit which prompted the outburst of self-reliance and optimism so characteristic of the whole period from 1770 to 1914. Obviously, if man is innately good and needs but to be freed from social restrictions, he is capable of tremendous achievements in this world of time, and does not need to postpone his hopes of personal salvation into eternity. Obviously, if man is a godlike creature whose ungodlike actions are due to the frustrations of social conventions, there is no need to worry about service to God or devotion to any otherworldly end. Man can accomplish most by service to himself and devotion to the goals of this world. Thus came the triumph of secularism. Closely related to these 19th century beliefs that human nature is good, that society is bad, and that optimism and secularism were reasonable attitudes, were certain theories about the nature of evil. To the 19th century mind, evil, or sin, was a negative conception. It merely indicated a lack, or, at most, a distortion of good. Any idea of sin or evil as a malignant positive force opposed to good, and capable of existing by its own nature, was completely lacking in the typical 19th century mind. To such a mind, the only evil was frustration and the only sin, repression. Just as the negative idea of the nature of evil flowed from the belief that human nature was good, so the idea of liberalism flowed from the belief that society was bad. For, if society was bad, the state which was the organised coercive power of society, was doubly bad, and if man was good, he should be freed, above all, from the coercive power of the state. Liberalism was the crop which emerged from this soil. In its broadest aspect, liberalism believed that men should be freed from coercive power as completely as possible. In its narrowest aspect, liberalism believed that the economic activities of man should be freed completely from state interference. This latter belief, summed up in the battle cry, No Government in Business, was commonly called laissez-faire. Liberalism, which included laissez-faire, was a wider term because it would have freed men from the coercive power of any church, army, or other institution, and would have left to society little power beyond that required to prevent the strong from physically oppressing the weak. From either aspect, liberalism was based on an almost universally accepted 19th century superstition known as the community of interests. This strange and unexamined belief held that there really existed, in the long run, a community of interests between the members of a society. It maintained that, in the long run, what was good for one member of the society was good for all, and that what was, was bad for one was bad for all. But it went much further than this. The theory of community interests believed that there did exist a possible social pattern in which each member of society would be secure, free and prosperous and that this pattern could be achieved by a process of adjustment so that each person could fall into that place in the pattern to which his innate abilities entitled him. This implied two corollaries which the 19th century was prepared to accept. One, that human abilities are innate and can only be distorted or suppressed by social discipline, and two, that 
that each individual is the best judge of his own self-interest. All these together form the doctrine of the community of interests, a doctrine which maintained that if each individual does what seems best for himself, the result, in the long run, will be the best for society as a whole. Closely related to the idea of the community of interests were two other beliefs of the 19th century, the belief in progress and in democracy. The average man of 1880 was convinced that he was the culmination of a long process of inevitable progress, which had been going on for untold millennia and which would continue indefinitely into the future. This belief in progress was so fixed that it tended to regard progress as both inevitable and automatic. Out of the struggles and conflicts of the universe, better things were constantly emerging, and the wishes or plans of the subjects themselves had little to do with the process. The idea of democracy was also accepted as inevitable, although not always as desirable, for the 19th century could not completely submerge a lingering feeling that rule by the best or rule by the strong would be better than rule by the majority. But the facts of political development made rule by the majority unavoidable, and it came to be accepted, at least in Western Europe, especially since it was compatible with liberalism and with the community of interests. Liberalism, community of interests, and the belief in progress led almost inevitably to the practice and theory of capitalism. Capitalism was an economic system in which the motivating force was the desire for private profit as determined in a price system. Such a system, it was felt, by seeking the aggrandization of profits for each individual, would give unprecedented economic progress under liberalism and in accord with the community of interests. In the 19th century, this system, in association with the unprecedented advance of natural science, had given rise to industrialism, that is, power production, and urbanism, that is, city life both of which were regarded as inevitable concomitants of progress by most people, but with the greatest suspicion by a persistent and vocal minority. The 19th century was also an age of science. By this term, we mean the belief that the universe obeyed rational laws which could be found by observation and could be used to control it. This belief was closely connected with the optimism of the period, with its belief in inevitable progress and with secularism. The latter appeared as a tendency towards materialism. This could be defined as the belief that all reality is ultimately explicable in terms of the physical and chemical laws which apply to temporal matter. The last attribute of the 19th century is by no means the least. Nationalism. It was the Great Age of Nationalism, a movement which has been discussed in many lengthy and inconclusive books, but which can be defined for our purposes as a movement for political unity with those with whom we believe we are kin. As such, nationalism in the 19th century had a dynamic force which worked in two directions. On the one side, it served to bind persons of the same nationality together into a tight, emotionally satisfying unit. On the other side, it served to divide persons of different nationality into antagonistic groups, often to the injury of their real mutual political, economic or cultural advantages. Thus, in the period to which we refer, nationalism sometimes acted as a cohesive force, creating a united Germany and a united Italy out of a medley of distinct political units. But sometimes, on the other hand, nationalism acted as a disruptive force within such dynastic states as the Habsburg Empire or the Ottoman Empire, splitting these great states into a number of distinctive political units. These characteristics of the 19th century have been so largely modified in the 20th century that it might appear, at first glance, as if the latter were nothing more than the opposite of the former. This is not completely accurate. 
but there can be no doubt that most of these characteristics have been drastically modified in the 20th century. This change has arisen from a series of shattering experiences which have profoundly disturbed patterns of behaviour and of belief, of social organisations and human hopes. Of these shattering experiences, the chief were the trauma of the First World War, the long-drawn-out agony of the World Depression, and the unprecedented violence of destruction of the Second World War. Of these three, the First World War was undoubtedly the most important. To a people who believed in the innate goodness of man, in inevitable progress, in the community of interests, and in evil as merely the absence of good, the First World War, with its millions of persons dead and its billions of dollars wasted, was a blow so terrible as to be beyond human ability to comprehend. As a matter of fact, no real success was achieved in comprehending it. The people of the day regarded it as a temporary and inexplicable aberration to be ended as soon as possible and forgotten as soon as ended. Accordingly, men were almost unanimous in 1919 in their determination to restore the world of 1913. This effort was a failure. After ten years of effort to conceal the new reality of social life by a facade painted to look like 1913, the facts burst through the pretense, and men were forced, willingly or not, to face the grim reality of the 20th century. The events which destroyed the pretty dream world of 1919 to 1929 were the stock market crash, the world's depression, the world financial crisis, and ultimately the martial clamour of rearmament and aggression. Thus, depression and war forced men to realise that the old world of the 19th century had passed forever and made them seek to create a new world in accordance with the facts of present-day conditions. This new world, the child of the period 1914 to 1945, assumed its recognisable form only as the first half of the century drew to a close. In contrast with the 19th century belief that human nature is innately good and that society is corrupting, the 20th century came to believe that human nature is, if not innately bad, at least capable of being very evil. Left to himself, it seems today, man falls very easily to the level of the jungle or even lower, and this result can be prevented only by training and the coercive power of society. Thus, man is capable of great evil, but society can prevent this. Along with this change from good men and bad society to bad men and good society, has appeared a reaction from optimism to pessimism and from secularism to religion. At the same time, the view that evil is merely the absence of good has been replaced with the idea that evil is a very positive force, which must be resisted and overcome. The horrors of Hitler's concentration camps and of Stalin's slave labour units are chiefly responsible for this change. Associated with these changes are a number of others. The belief that human abilities are innate and should be left free from social duress in order to display themselves has been replaced by the idea that human abilities are the result of social training and must be directed to socially acceptable ends. Thus, liberalism and laissez-faire are to be replaced, apparently, by social discipline and planning. The community of interests, which would appear if men were merely left to pursue their own desires, has been replaced by the idea of the welfare community, which must be created by conscious organising action. The belief in progress has been replaced by the fear of social retrogression or even human annihilation. The old march of democracy now yields to the insidious advance of authoritarianism, and the individual capitalism of the profit motive seems about to be replaced by the state capitalism of the welfare economy. Science, on all sides, is challenged by mysticisms, 
some of which march under the banner of science itself. Urbanism has passed its peak, and is replaced by suburbanism, or even flights to the country, and nationalism finds its patriotic appeal challenged by appeals to much wider groups of class, ideological or continental scope. We have already given some attention to the fashion in which a number of Western European innovations, such as industrialism and the demographic explosion, diffused outwards to the peripheral non-European world at such different rates of speed that they arrived in Asia in quite a different order from that in which they had left Western Europe. The same phenomenon had been seen within Western civilization in regards to the 19th century characteristics of Europe, which we have enumerated. For example, nationalism was already evident in England at the time of the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. It raged through France in the period after 1789. It reached Germany and Italy only after 1815, became a potent force in Russia and the Balkans towards the end of the 19th century, and was noticeable in China, India and Indonesia, and even Negro Africa, only in the 20th century. Somewhat similar patterns of diffusion can be found in regard to the spread of democracy, of parliamentary government, of liberalism, and of secularism. The rule, however, is not so general or so simple as it appears at first glance. The exceptions and the complications appear more numerous as we approach the 20th century. Even earlier, it was evident that the arrival of the sovereign state did not follow this pattern, enlightened despotism and the growth of supreme public authority appearing in Germany and even in Italy before it appeared in France. Universal free education also appeared in Central Europe before it appeared in a Western country like England. Socialism also is a product of Central Europe rather than of Western Europe and moved from the former to the latter only in the fifth decade of the 20th century. These exceptions to the general rule about the eastward movement of modern historical developments have various explanations. Some of these are obvious, but others are very complicated. As an example of such a complication, we might mention that in Western Europe, nationalism Industrialism, liberalism, and democracy were generally reached in this order. But in Germany, they all appeared about the same time. To the Germans, it appeared that they could achieve nationalism and industrialism, both of which they wanted, more rapidly and more successfully if they sacrificed liberalism and democracy. Thus, in Germany, nationalism was achieved in an undemocratic way by blood and iron, as Bismarck put it, while industrialism was achieved under state auspices rather than through liberalism. This selection of elements and the resulting playing off of elements against one another was possible in more peripheral areas only because these areas had the earlier experience of Western Europe to study, copy, avoid or modify. Sometimes they had to modify these traits as they developed. This can be seen from the following considerations. When the Industrial Revolution began in England and France, these countries were able to raise the necessary capital for new factories because they already had the Agricultural Revolution and because, as the earliest producers of industrial goods, they made excessive profits which could be used to provide capital. But in Germany and in Russia, Capital was much more difficult to find, because they obtained the Industrial Revolution later, when they had to compete with England and France, and could not earn such large profits, and also because they did not already have an established agricultural revolution on which to build their Industrial Revolution. Accordingly, while Western Europe, with plenty of capital and cheap, democratic weapons, could finance its industrialization with liberalism and democracy, Central and Eastern Europe had difficulty financing industrialism, and there the process was delayed to a period when cheap and simple democratic weapons were being replaced by expensive and complicated weapons.
This meant that the capital for railroads and factories had to be raised with government assistance. Liberalism waned, rising nationalism encouraged this tendency, and the undemocratic nature of existing weapons made it clear that both liberalism and democracy were living a most precarious existence. As a consequence of situations such as this, some of the traits which arose in Western Europe in the 19th century moved outward to more peripheral areas of Europe and Asia with great difficulty and for only a brief period. Among these less sturdy traits of Western Europe's great century, we might mention liberalism, democracy, the parliamentary system, optimism and the belief in inevitable progress. These were, we might say, flowers of such delicate nature that they could not survive any extended period of stormy weather. That the 20th century subjected them to long periods of very stormy weather is clear when we consider that it brought a world economic depression sandwiched between two world wars.